is no problem too big, God cannot solve it. There is no mountain too tall, He cannot move it. There is no storm too dark. Today, uh, this evening, I've entitled a presentation I'm going to share with you, Jars of Clay. <clears throat> Jars of Clay. And um, the reason I've called it this is because I've always been fascinated by this text here that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, but we, that's you and I, we have this treasure and we'll talk about the treasure in a minute. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of who? Uh, and not of us. Not of us, okay? And so, you know, being very visual that I am and uh, I just employ my imagination on these things, I look at this text and I think earthen vessels, jars of clay. Is that what we are? Jars of clay. Well, listen, I, you know, it's interesting because as I thought about this text, the affinity between clay and, and ourselves is, is very evident, kind of became to me. I remembered that there in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, our creator, our amazing creator, lovingly took from the clay, the, the ground, so to speak, and formed and shaped Adam. And then, of course, breathed into him the breath of life. And that, that mass of clay became a living soul. Amen? And so there is, uh, right from the very beginning, an affinity. You know, do you realize that uh, just about all the elements that we're made of, with the exception of maybe oxygen and nitrogen that are gases, but just about everything else comes from the ground, carbon, uh, sulfur, you know, and all the other elements, trace elements, and so forth. So you and I really are jars of clay, earthen vessels, okay? But as I looked at the text, um, I realized that there was really more to it. In other words, what is the treasure? 
that we're holding. And so we have to look at the verse before that to come to terms with that. Paul says, for it is the God who commanded, what? Light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so what is the, what is the treasure that these earthen vessels, you and I, are meant to, to carry? It's the light of the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus, that amazing mystery of God and man living together in harmony, the light that's there. And you know, of course, it made me think again, graphic, that I am, it made me think about another experience where earthen vessels uh, were, were uh, depositories for light. Can you think of a time in scripture where that happened? Ah, Gideon, thank you, okay? So we had those, those earthen vessels that the lights, the torches were put in and contained them until the appropriate time to let them shine. And of course, in Gideon's time, they had to be what? Broken, because the sound was part of the, kind of the, 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 the ambience that had to take place to terrify all those Midianites and all those, you know, enemy that were against the Israelites, and it worked. Even in the breaking of the earthen vessels, something good came out of it. The noise, the lights were exposed. And so, yes, earthen vessels and light go together. Now, it's possible that Paul maybe had this idea in mind as well, which is very common in his day the light coming from this beautiful earthen vessel. This is what the ancient lamps look like. A clay pot, a jar of clay with oil in it, but it was a holding that treasure of light and giving it out. So are you with me? Does that help make sense a little bit of, of the text that we're looking at? I know that was helpful to me as I thought about it. Um, but what I want to do is kind of go beyond even the idea of light because, you know, there are a great many, uh, a great deal of different types of earthen vessels. And they hold not just light, but they hold liquid. And liquid is a treasure as well. And so what I'd like to do is... Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that whole idea of what it is, what it means to be an earthen vessel, and the purpose that God has for us. I mean, after all, if you're a vessel, that means that, you know, design dictates use and purpose. Amen? Does that make sense? I know that some pots are pretty, and they just, they're just kind of there for adornment, but they're really made to do something to carry out a specific function. And I want to explore that with you. But before we do, I'm going to show you a video clip. And please make sure that the uh, sound is up for me. Um, that's going to really explain a lot of things about what it means for God to shape you and I into that vessel that he can use for a very, very special purpose. You. You are a special, unique earthen vessel, a jar of clay that God wants to use to dispense light and, and life-giving fluid, liquid, water to those around you. But how does he get you and I to the place where we're useful? Are you interested? Okay, well, I'm going to play this video. And, and forgive me, it's going to be kind of long. Uh, you know, I realize... Uh, it's about 15, 20 minutes long, but I think you'll find it so interesting. I don't think you'll go to sleep, and uh, I think you'll be watching for, to hear from the Lord from this video.
In the analysis of any metaphor, it is of the primary importance that the correct roles be assigned. In the metaphor of the potter and the clay, there are two distinct roles, the potter and the clay. Though it may seem obvious, it is my assertion that God is to play the role of the potter and that we humans are to play the role of the clay in relation to him. To verify this assertion, it is necessary to look to scripture. And where better to start than in the beginning? In Genesis 2.7 it reads, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So, just as God created man from the dust of the ground, so too can a potter create clay by mixing dirt and water. Next, we look to the book of Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. There is no question that the potter can mold the clay however he chooses to, and it is clear in this passage that God is stating that we are the clay. But, for good measure, let's look at one more verse. In Isaiah 64, 8, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Here, it is not God speaking, but Isaiah professing that God is the potter and we are the clay. Which brings us to our first question. Who do we act like more, the potter or the clay? More often than not, do we assume control and try to mold God to suit our needs, or are we surrendered to the will of God and simply listening for our instructions? So as not to get bogged down, we'll come back to this one. For now, let's start evaluating the potter's actual process. The first step in the potter's process is to cut a piece of clay from the block and begin wedging the clay. The wedging process is very similar to a process of kneading bread dough, but as the consistency of the clay is much more dense than that of dough, a much more firm hand is required with the clay. The purpose of the wedging process is to prepare the clay to be thrown onto the wheel by softening the clay, aligning the clay particles, and removing any air bubbles within the clay that might compromise the structural integrity of the pottery later on. To someone unfamiliar with the wedging process, it might look as though the potter is simply beating the clay. Which brings us to our next question. Have you ever felt like you were being wedged by God? If you answered yes, you are not alone. In Matthew 3.16-4.1 through 4, 1, it reads, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Seriously? Jesus was baptized. God said he was well pleased with him. And then he was immediately led to the desert to be tempted by the devil for forty days. This trial could not have been a punishment. Though we normally experience difficult situations as a result of our own bad decisions, I believe this is a great example of how sometimes difficult situations just happen. Like when your company shuts down and everyone loses their job, or your parents get a divorce, or your best friend moves away, or someone you love is diagnosed with cancer. These aren't punishments for your bad decisions or actions, but if they aren't punishments, what are they? Well, I believe it's God wedging us, making us malleable in his hands, and preparing us for what he has in store for us next. Once the clay has been sufficiently wedged, it is thrown onto the wheel and the potter begins the process of centering the clay. In order to ensure that the clay glides easily through their fingers, the potter starts off by generously adding water to the clay. Then, by applying a significant amount of force through a steady hand, the potter pushes the clay into the center of the spinning wheel. This is perhaps the most difficult and most important part of the entire pottery process. It is difficult because the clay is fighting to fly off the spinning wheel due to centripetal force, and it is the most important because if the potter moves on to the next step without having the clay in the absolute center of the wheel, the form the potter makes will inevitably turn out lopsided, at best, 
and completely unusable at worst. When the piece of clay is perfectly centered, it appears motionless on the wheel. But when it is off-center, it is very easy to see its wobble, especially from a distance, which is why a teacher can easily detect that a student's piece is off-center when the student isn't sure. In much the same way, isn't it far easier for us to see the imperfections of others than the imperfections that exist in our own lives? Here is the next question. Have you ever felt off-center or out of sync in your relationship with God? Once the clay has been centered, the potter will proceed to open the vessel and pull up the walls. This act of creating the form starts with the potter pressing their fingers into the center of the clay, creating a hole that will become the vessel's usable space. As the potter's fingers reach approximately a quarter of an inch away from the bottom of the wheel head, the potter will begin to move their fingers outwards, towards the edge of the wheel, thus causing the walls of the form to expand. Notice how though the potter is using both hands to mold the clay, their hands are always working together in the same location as one unit. Notice the constant adding and subtracting of water with the sponge. Notice the steady hands and the consistent contact that the potter has with the clay. This is how I imagine God the potter handling us. Constant attention, constant molding, consistent correction. A gentle touch but with a firm and steady hand all in order for him to make us into what he intended for us to be. Next, the potter will start to gently pinch the walls while raising their hands upwards. This makes the walls of the form grow thinner and taller. But a problem occurs when we don't agree with God's plan for us. To continue with the metaphor, let's say the potter is intending to create a wonderful vase with this clay, but the clay doesn't want to be a vase. A vase, says the clay? I don't want to be a vase. Vases are boring. What good are vases anyway? To which God responds, Vases are beautiful pieces of art that hold flowers full of love and bring joy to others. All vases do is watch flowers die, the clay says. I don't want to be a vase. I want to be a punch bowl. Yeah, a punch bowl. Punch bowls live exciting lives. They're at the center of the action. Everybody wants to be around the punch bowl. I don't want to be a vase. Does this exchange sound familiar? How many times has God attempted to mold us into something that we resisted? How many times has God called us to serve, to be kind, to love unconditionally, to give sacrificially, and to be more like His Son? How often has He called us to lay down our pride, to stand up for others, to forgive, and to surrender? But what about me, we respond? What about what I want? What about my dreams for a big house and prestigious titles and fame and fortune and adoring fans? Or what about my desire for a simple existence with a happy little family and a comfortable life? Why do you keep asking me to do things that are outside of my comfort zone? Why do you keep asking me to do things I'm afraid of? To which God responds, Because I know what's best for you. I created you for a purpose, and the only way to fulfill that purpose is for you to listen to me and follow me. After much wrestling with God and His will for our life, we will eventually reach a situation or circumstance where what God is asking of us is simply too different from our desires and our will. God, I'm always listening to you and always following you, but this time you're wrong. It's my life and I know what I'm doing. It's at this point that we make the bold decision to go our own way and dismiss the potter. And how does God respond? Like a gentleman. He quietly and respectfully honors our wishes and allows us to do as we please. I think C.S. Lewis summed it up perfectly when he wrote, There are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, In the end, Thy will be done. After dismissing the potter, we have no other choice but to literally take matters into our own hands. Even though we are completely unqualified to make a punch bowl, it is now up to us to mold this half-finished vase into what we believe it should be. As we awkwardly attempt to mold this form, we turn to our equally unqualified friends and family for advice. But what do they know about making punch bowls? Chances are, even less than us so we are forced to go it alone. Inevitably, our vase turned punch bowl will fall. 
In Isaiah 29, 15 through 16, it reads, Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, Who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, He did not make me. Can the pot say of the potter, He knows nothing? In light of these verses, we probably should have known better. Even so, as we look at the mess we've made, we ask quietly at first, and then louder as our frustration grows. Why, God? Why did you let this happen? And where did it all go wrong? At this point, we can trim off the ruined piece of our form and continue on with our process. But more mistakes will inevitably follow, and our punch bowl will shrink to a cereal bowl, then a salsa dish and eventually the proverbial ashtray. Ultimately, we will progress through the stages of denial, anger, and sorrow, eventually leading us to a state of surrender. It is here where we will ask God, or better yet, beg God to come back. God, I have made a complete mess of everything. I have tried to fix it, but it seems like everything I try only makes things worse. I am so sorry I dismissed you. Will you please come back? To which God responds, Of course. As the potter returns to the situation, the setup is now different. Rather than simply taking over, we partner together with the potter to create the form. In order to instruct us properly, the potter will at times demonstrate how our hands should be placed. At times, they will place their hands on top of ours, and at times the potter will allow us to give it a try alone. Once we have gotten the proper feel for the clay, it will be time to move forward. Now, let's get back to making that vase, God will tell us. Vase? What do you mean, vase? We will respond. When I asked you to come back because I needed help, I asked you to come back to help me make the punch bowl, not the vase. And once again, as we will do over and over again throughout our life, we will dismiss the potter. Once a form has been successfully created, the potter will set it aside to dry. At first, it seems as though this drying stage would be pretty tough to mess up, but it's actually more complicated than it seems. Before the form is completely dry, the bottom must be trimmed to create a foot and any additional pieces like the handle of a mug or the spout of a teapot must be attached. If we are lazy and we leave the form drying too long, not only will we not be able to attach the additional pieces, but the form will dry out and crumble, eventually returning to dust. In our performance-based society, as it is speed and results that are rewarded, we often tend to consider laziness as the worst character trait a person can have. And yet, though the form is destroyed by laziness, it is our impatience that causes the most damage. When we are impatient, we will tend to move the vessel on to the firing stage before it had had time to dry completely. When heated in the firing stage, the moisture still present in the clay will rapidly expand, causing the vessel to literally explode. So what's the difference? Crumble, explode, either way the form is destroyed. The difference is that when a form crumbles, only the form is destroyed. But when the form explodes, not only is it destroyed, but it destroys all of the forms around it as well. So here's the question. How many times have we hurt the people around us because of our impatience? How many times have we rushed God's timing and taken matters into our own hands only to make a mess of our situations? Oftentimes, We think that we're going through our trials alone and that our actions don't affect anyone else. But the truth is that we have never, ever gone through a trial alone. Though it may feel as though we're alone, our loved ones are almost always hurting with us and for us when we make poor decisions that lead us into unfortunate situations. Once the clay form is sufficiently dry, It is placed in an electric kiln and fired to 1,945 degrees for upwards of 8 hours. When the clay form goes into the kiln, it is smooth and fragile, but when it comes out of the kiln, it is hard and rough and dry like cement. 
When the clay goes into the kiln, it is full of chemical impurities. But when it comes out, the majority of the impurities have been burned away. Does this sound familiar? Isn't this how it is with us and our life trials? Long spells of intense heat, seemingly trying to kill us, but in the end making us stronger and more refined? After the bisque firing, though the form is strong, it is still porous, meaning that liquid can seep through the walls. As such, the form is unusable and needs to be glazed. Glaze is a coating that serves to decorate and waterproof a ceramic vessel. When the glaze is ready to be applied, it is in liquid form similar to paint. As such, the ceramic vessel can be decorated by dipping it in the glaze, or the glaze can even be delicately applied using a fine-tipped paintbrush. Thus, with attention to detail and a gentle touch, the potter cares for and prepares the masterpiece in progress. Cares for and prepares. Well, doesn't that just say it all? As I understand it, there are only three possible stages in life. You are either about to go through a trial, you are in the midst of a trial, or you just came out of a trial. If you are about to go through a trial, then God is preparing you. If you just came out of a trial, then God is caring for you, and yes, preparing you for the next trial. God cares and prepares. So it is too with the potter and the clay. Once the vessel has been glazed, it is ready for the next firing. Yes, that's correct. Another firing. But this firing is different. This is a soda firing as opposed to a bisque firing. While the bisque firing only lasted 8 hours, this soda firing will last up to 14 hours. And while the bisque firing only reached 1,945 degrees, this soda firing will top out at 2,350 degrees. Another difference is that the bisque kiln utilized electricity to heat the oven, whereas the soda kiln uses gas, which introduces flames into the kiln. Now, doesn't this metaphor fit right in with our own life experiences? We go through a difficult trial, we then get a period of recovery, rest, and preparation, only to go into another trial that is hotter and longer than the last one? Here's a point of interest. When do you think that the kiln reaches its peak temperature of 2,350 degrees? Is it in the first hour of firing, the seventh hour of firing, or the last hour of firing? Normally, our trials start out manageable, but as time progresses, they tend to get more and more difficult. The longer the trial lasts, the harder and hotter they get. Well, here's some encouragement. If you're in the midst of an incredibly long, incredibly challenging trial, and you're not sure how much more you can take, then it is literally time to rejoice. For just like the soda firing, the intensity of our trials peak at the end. If it's getting hotter, that means you're getting closer. The finish line is just around the bend. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Though at times it may be difficult to recognize, these trials purify us and make us stronger. They humble us and at the same time create in us a confidence that with God, nothing is impossible. In the long view, these trials are good for us. The same is true for the pot. During the soda firing, the glaze that was painted onto the pot transforms from a coat of paint into a thin layer of glass. Most people think that the glaze is primarily for decoration, but it's this layer of non-porous glass that makes the ceramic form safe to eat and drink out of, which means that without this last firing, the vessel would leak, break apart, and be of no use. And just as the pot needs these firings to be made useful, so too do we need our trials. God creates forms to be useful. He didn't make us to simply sit and look pretty. He made us so that we, He could use us in order to carry out His will of loving one another. But, in order for us to be useful, we must first be wedged and centered, and pulled, and trimmed, and handled, and dried, and fired, and glazed, and fired again. At this point, it should be no secret, being clay is hard work. 
Some people think that once you become a follower of Jesus Christ that all of your problems simply melt away, but that's just not the case. On the contrary, surrendering your life to Christ and staying surrendered is incredibly difficult. Even so, the only thing harder than following Jesus and His will for our lives is, well, not following Jesus and trying to do it on our own. Without the potter, the clay has no purpose. Without the potter, the clay is of no use. But with the potter, like us with God, oh, the possibilities. In case you want to find this on the web, there's some of the information. Uh, it's called The Potter, God the Potter. Okay, you can find it on YouTube. Okay, thank you. Wow, the next time that you hold a mug in your hand, think about all of this. But also think about your own life. Think about what God is trying to do with you. I'm going to very briefly uh, go over some things that uh, I thought were interesting in the video there and, and kind of lead to, again, usefulness. Um, when I was, a, when I was uh, a young person, I went through uh, some training in doing pots and so forth. And I remember that when you first get the clay out of the bag, it's literally something that they just ripped out of the ground. And so you have to then look at that lump of clay and decide what part of it can you use and use it for what. And so the same lump of clay may have a piece of it that is very fine and that you can use for a nice delicate plate, so to speak, but the very same lump of clay, part of it may not be, you know, the type that you would use for something delicate. And so the clay has to be willing to have the master potter decide what the use of the clay is. And I think of that text in Romans 9.21, where the Apostle Paul says, has the potter no right to make from the same lump of clay one vessel for special use and another for ordinary use? You know, Paul's talking about the clay arguing with the potter and part of the clay is saying, well, I really think I should be that punch bowl. And the other saying, well, I don't want to be a cereal bowl. Well, I, I looked in our home and I found some things made of clay and uh, you'll see the, the darker little pot we use to make baked beans. And we use that thing all the time. That's for ordinary use. But of course, the, the soup terrain on the other side, that white thing, uh, is only for special occasions when we have guests and so forth and so on. Very delicate. You got to kind of be careful with it. Looks great. It's fun to ladle. And I bet if it could speak to us, it'd say, I'm a soup terrine. And the little pot may say, well, I'm just a baked bean pot. But the truth of the matter is, which is more important? Which one do we use more? It's that baked bean pot. The ordinary one really is the one. And so you may think that, well, you know, what do I have to offer? Or why doesn't God do something really special in my life and kind of put me, you know, where they are to do those special things? Well, friends, he may still be wedging you. He may still be centering you. He may still be in some process. And the truth is that he may decide that, that, that he needs you because in, to be an ordinary plate because it's so important. There's, there's some major use 
that he wants to, a function that he wants to fulfill, and he wants somebody like you to be able to, to do that and take that very, very special role. Amen? So we have to start looking at what God is doing in our lives from the potter's eyes, from the potter's eyes, so that we can appreciate and maybe get to that place where we can be of maximum use in this life. Now, here's one other thing, and I wanted to share this little parable with you. It's, it's a well-known parable called the crack pot. And uh, some of us struggle because, you know, there are things that happen to us in our life, often things we didn't ask for, um, maybe even very, very challenging things, things that we're not sure whether we can recover from them or not. And we really ask ourselves, can I be of any use? Am I any good? I'm, you may even feel like you're trash. But I want to share this little parable with you because it really is so instructive. I'm giving the Indian version. Maybe you've heard the Chinese version. This is the Indian version. And uh, so there was a, a, a servant who went to work for a wealthy master in ancient India, and um, he was hired on, oh, let's say, uh, early, early spring, late uh, winter. So it was dry, dreary, uh, but he got a job, and so he was glad. And he was told to carry water. He was given these two pots. And uh, when he went to fill the water and scooped it up down by the river and then walked the long path back up to the house, he realized that one of the pots was cracked. P water was just kind of pouring out. And so he said, this is no good. Uh, when I get to the house, I'm going to tell the master, and we'll get it straightened out. So he gets to the house. Of course, one was full, and he emptied it and you know, was happy with that. But when he came to the other pot, there was not much water left in that. He emptied that too. And he went straight to the master, and he said, Master, you know, there's a problem with the pot. It's, it's cracked. It's no good. We need to replace it. The master went and looked at the situation, and he smiled, and he says, yes, actually, I'm quite aware of that pot. Use it. Just use it. Trust me. Well, you know, the servant's thinking, I'm, I'm just a servant. I'll just whatever. I'll do what the master asks. And so day by day, he would go down and he'd fetch his water. And of course, he knew that by the time that he got to the house, most of the water would have spilled out on the path. And, uh, and it was frustrating for him, to, to be honest. And uh, he did this month after month. And, you know, spring came and, uh, you know, the weather was nice and he was happy with that, but he was always troubled about that cracked pot. And so one day he'd had enough, and so he said to the he said, I'm, I'm just going to tell the master, that's it. Uh, I know what he told me, but, but this really needs to change. And so he went back to the master and he said, Lord, this pot is really almost useless. It has to go. It's of no use, really, barely of any use. And the master smiled at him, and he said, open your eyes. He said, have you not noticed the path on the side where that pot carries water and what it's been doing for the flowers that are all along the path? And so what appeared to be a useless pot was in fact a pot that had a very, very special use. And the master, rather than throwing it out and throwing it away and saying it's no good, again, he saw it through very different eyes. And you and I need to be looking at our lives through the eyes of the master because he can use anything. And in fact, he will take even damaged pots. And I think to some degree we're all damaged, aren't we? He will use damaged pots to do great things, to bring beauty and life to 
others. Now, before we're done tonight, um, I want to get to, again, what really is the burden of, of uh, my talk here. You see these clay pots, these earthen vessels, and they all, uh, there's all kinds, aren't there? Mugs and big water pots and even jars for carrying uh, documents and so forth, dishes, etc. They're really all around us, used all the time. But what I want you to notice is that they're not just there to be pretty. They're there to, to be filled and then to be emptied. To be filled and then to be emptied. To be filled and then to be emptied. And that, my friends, is really what a an earthen vessel, a jar of clay is all about. It really is not about being pretty. It's not about occupying space on a shelf and saying, look at me. It's about being filled and it's about being poured out, being filled and being poured out, being filled and being poured out again and again and again, what do you think about your own life? Do you want a special position? Do you want to look pretty somewhere? Or do you want to experience real purpose in your life? You and I are jars of clay. And our purpose is to be filled and then to pour out again and again and again and again, I think of the talk that Jesus had with that woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman. And he says to her, whoever drinketh of the waters that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into what? Into everlasting life. It's a little typo there. And so can you see, Jesus is trying to help this woman understand. I'm ready to fill you. Will you give me room? Will you let me come into your life? If you do, I will be a well of water springing out. She had tried to fill her life with other things. Relationships. Men. Love. But she wasn't connected to the spring. And it's not a wonder that her life was dry and she didn't have much to offer. But here Jesus was saying, let me fill you and then pour. Pour all around you. Pour to everybody that you can see. I'll keep filling you. Just be ready to serve. Be ready to be filled. I think also of... Uh, and here, I, I love this picture. It's, it's kind of a picture that represents Jesus there at the, the Feast of Canaan. Can you see the water being turned into wine? Somebody did a nice job with that. I love that. But the point is this, really. The point is that you and I, as earthen vessels, just like in the story, the earthen vessels are important, aren't they? I mean, the, the, the miracle couldn't have been done without them. But really, the important thing was what? That they were being filled, like our, our text was suggesting, the, the text we started out with, that we are just meant to be uh, reservoirs of, of God's treasure, just to hold long enough to give it away to somebody else, and then to come back and get some more, and then give away and keep that process of filling and emptying, filling and emptying receiving love from the Lord and then giving that love away and serving. Can you see a picture of what your might, life might mean if you accept the role of being a jar of clay? <sighs> but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I want to uh, conclude with one more 
uh, short film. This one's just a, a few minutes, a very short film. But while you watch this, there's going to be a guy there. There's no talking. There's music. Um, there are words from scripture that will come out. Um, the guy, keep your eye on him. And if you would, if you want to let your imagine, imagination roll, imagine that he is Jesus and that you are the clay that is in his hands, okay? As you can see, the, the pot was never meant to just stay in the potter's shop. The pot needs to go out to receive and to give, to receive and to give. In closing, I want to leave this thought with you, lest you be tempted to lest you be tempted to mold your own life. These words from Beth Moore, without the potter, clay is just dirt. Tonight, I wonder if there's anyone here who would like to say to the potter, I want to stay in your hands. I want you to decide what I should be. I want you to wedge me as long as it takes to shape me and center me, to raise me up, to fire me in the kiln, to allow only those trials to come through that will make me firm and strong and prepare me for the trials that will come upon the whole world at the end of time, the big test, the final 
test. Is there anybody here who would like to say to the potter, I'm yours? Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> it is amazing, Lord, as we have seen tonight the, the care, the, the craftsmanship, the process, long, delicate at times, um, the critical measurements, the, the heat, just enough heat to make things work and timing, all of these things that we, when we're under trial and pressure, think, Lord, help us, deliver us, save us, get us out. But you know, you know what is needed. And Lord, you're shaping each one of us for that amazing service of love that you have in mind. Some of us will be everyday pots. Some of us maybe will have a very special use. Others, you know, all of us have our defects and our cracks, Lord. But we come to you as we are. And we pray that you will take us into your hands, shape, mold, fill, and pour us out for your use. This is our prayer in your blessed and loving name, Jesus. Amen.